the desert dark and drear, calling the sheep who've gone astray, far from the shepherd's fold away.
see at the old rugged cross. So aren't you glad of God's mercy? I was a sinner. I was lost and alone. Till God's great hand of mercy. just got the news today another soldier has departed gone on to glory to receive their rich reward a true soldier in the battle has now crossed over Jordan They've now laid down Their shield and their sword Who's gonna take Their place in the battle Who gonna stand for God and for right who's gonna lift the banner high be faithful till they die can't help but wonder who's gonna take their place
The invitation was given at the end of the service. Only one had come forward in revival that week. The pastor asked that one young man for his testimony. And joy filled my heart as I heard him speak. He said, I want to take my place in the battle. I want to stand for God and for I want to lift the banner high, be faithful till I die. As a soldier, I want to take his place. Who's going to take their place in the battle? Who's gonna stand for God and for right? Who's gonna lift the banner high, be faithful till they die? Can't help but wonder who's gonna take their place. I want to lift the banner high, be faithful till I die. As a soldier, I want to take my some faithful servants to the Lord, been to, on the field of the Netherlands for an awful long time, and uh, what a blessing they've been. Um, Holland and so on, and uh, they have been faithful. We got to visit with them a little bit last night, and it's wonderful when um, you run into people who stand on truth. You know, it's just not passing fads. It's not just what's for the moment. It's standing on the truth of God's word and just doing it day in, day out for uh, all the years that they've done it. And I thank God for them, and I pray God gives them health and continues their ministry there. It's a delight to have the Spoolstras. Brother John Spoolstra will be speaking to us at this time. Brother Spoolstra. Thank you, Doctor. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject, even though Dutch people have a reputation. They, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Brother Carl Boonstra. Uh, he's 93. He's not my brother, but his parents came from the same area where we were born in Friesland, uh, which is the northern part of Holland. And these uh, Dutch people, they have a reputation in America, in England, and everywhere, in Australia. And most of the sayings about Dutch people are negative. A Dutch uncle, a Dutch treat, uh, Dutch courage, you know, all negative uh, connotations. But when we talk about finances or we talk about money, Dutch are experts. Brother Carl Boonstra will tell you a Dutchman can sell or can buy from a Scotchman, sell to a Jew, and still make a profit. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And you've probably heard about the story about Dutch people inventing copper wire, Scotsman and the Dutchman fighting over a penny. You know, that's how they invented <laughs> copper wire. I know that's nonsense. I know. I, and all I'm saying is to, today, your pastor has asked me to preach on the subject. I, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I do have, what's the word, personal experience with it. Because I am just like you are, a member of a church, 
and I give what belongs to the Lord, the tithe, plus missions giving. So I, I'm just telling you what I'm doing this morning, challenging you. But let's, before we do that, let's pray together and that God might help us to be in tune, not only you to me and me sensitive to your needs, but that God would have an opportunity to speak to both of us, all of us. Shall we pray together? Father in heaven, we do thank you so much. We declare our dependence on you. Every blessing that we experience comes from you. You have given and given until there was no more to give. And somebody said heaven was empty. I don't believe it. But when the Lord Jesus came to this earth, there was nothing left to give. He gave himself. He emptied himself. We just thank you for the supreme example, example of giving. And we just ask that you'd help us that we might not feel this message as an onslaught on our wallet, uh, on our wallet, uh, but that our, this message may be a challenge for us to grow in grace of giving. And we just ask that you'd help us to be sensitive, help us to put a lot of things, uh, ambitions and plans and things that we thought to buy in the next future or in the short in the future, that we might, might put them into perspective in the light of what you want us to do. What is your will for our life? For the coming year in this giving in regard to faith promise, we just ask that you'd help us be open and sensitive and that you would lead and guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Giving you find all over in the Bible. And I have... Uh, I am no, no expert on it. I have some experience on it, and I'll give you my testimony about what, uh, what I've discovered. But I'm not the only one who discovered that there is a giving in the Bible. But grace is always involved. When somebody gives, it's grace. You know, I was so arrogant. The first time I gave my testimony, a pastor gave me a check. And I said, I don't need that. <laughs> arrogant. Arrogant, that's what I was. And I, I, I shared it with a man, and he said, Brother John, it's a humbling experience to receive. Uh, th but it's the grace of giving. It's a humbling experience. Before we can be saved, we need to be humbled and to be ready to receive forgiveness. Amen. <laughs> and it's so hard for a Dutchman to humble himself and it's so hard for Missourians and it's so hard for people everywhere to do the same thing but there is something about being gracious in giving and gracious in receiving and uh, what a blessing it is I used a because I didn't speak Romania we, we brought goods to Romania to help and strengthen the hand of a pastor. Pastor never said, I'm too proud to receive this. But the pastors were able, because the government didn't do anything for people, and people said, Pastor, can you help? Pastor, can you help? And so we strengthened the hands of pastor. And I, I turned with them to the Corinthians letter, Second Corinthians, and that, that, uh, that the, the want of the one and the supply of the other might bound to the, of the, that it might be contributing to the glory of God. And that is basically the premise, and that is the, the situation where we're at. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul gives a, a, a declaration of, I'm going to 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 8, and 2 Corinthians 9, if you could put your fingers there someplace, we'll come back to that. And the Apostle Paul uh, was, was, had confidence about the preparedness and the willingness and the obedience of those, uh, all, all of those things uh, about the giving in the, churches, uh, the church in Corinth. There's confidence. There was confidence based on two things. Number one is their, their, their willingness uh, that these Corinthians followed the instructions uh, in regard to the church discipline, there was somebody in the church had sinned, and they dealt with it, and they followed through with it, and Paul says, that's yeah, great, that I commend you on that. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is that they had showed uh, respect to Titus uh, in the way how they had responded to Titus, uh, because Titus was sent by the Apostle Paul. And Paul commends the, uh, uh, commends the, the Corinthians church. And everything that Paul had said about the Corinthians to other churches, 
they had confirmed. And, and so what Paul asked them to do, they did from the heart. That is a very difficult thing for us to do, to do something that you're being asked. All right. No, 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 no. It's not all right. He wants me to. She wants me to. No, that's not from the heart. Is there anything else I could do? Is there anything else with a cheerfulness? You know, if you want to have joy in giving because God loves a cheerful giver, then you will have to do better than all right. God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I was confronted with faith promise giving a few weeks after I was saved. In Australia, I got a pink slip. A pink slip means I got the notice that I had no longer a job. That's a pink slip. And I heard this message about faith promise giving. I said to Joanne, if this thing is working, it's got to work now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we had no income at all that we could calculate, figure out, bookkeeper's faith, you know. We couldn't. So we prayed. And on Monday, I went out to an industrial estate, knocked on doors at different places that you know, sometimes they advertise vacancy, you know, that they have an employee. And, and I knocked on every door, vacancy or no vacancy, I knocked on every door. But by the end of the day, I had a job and I made more money than before. And it made up the difference what we had promised on faith, promise giving. I, I was sold on the idea. Sorry. I was sold on the idea, not because it worked, but it was by faith. No, no, of course, I had to go out and do a number of things. I recognized that. But God knew already, long before, that he needed to teach me, trust him. Trust him. And it's not a matter of prosperity gospel. I'll stay away from that as far as I can. But if the Holy Spirit puts on your heart to do X, then do X. If the Holy Spirit puts on your heart to do why, then do why. And if he, you know, of course, the letter Z is in the alphabet too. But whatever he, he tells you or teaches you to do, number one, you need to be totally sold out before the Holy Spirit can speak to you. These Macedonians, they gave of themselves first. If you're not sold out, how does God speak to you? It's an amazing thing. Paul had said to the Corinthians, or about the Corinthians, this is a great church and they do exactly as I have asked them to do. And everything that they have been asked to do, they did from the heart. And so Paul says, I am rejoicing. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 16, the last verse, he says, I rejoice for, therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. They're taking care of church matters. They're taking care of other things. And then, of course, in this giving. And then he says, moreover, in chapter 8, verse 1, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit. Now, I wasn't raised on King James language, but to do, we do you to wit. We know the word wit, a witty person, a person who has knowledge, has understanding. We want you to know, put you in the know uh, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. I need to give you a little bit of background. Corinth was a world city at that time. And Macedonia, Macedonia, a number of cities, you know the, you know the names of the city. I'll just renumerate, not because I want to show you what I know, but uh, we just want to know, is it biblical what we're doing? And these churches in Macedonia, Macedonia is Philippi. You know a number of people in the church in Philippi. There was a jailer, there was Lydia, there was a girl that had been demon-possessed. We know those kind of people. That's what the congregation was made up, the people in Philippi. The letter to the Philippians is a result of that. What a blessing to see those Philippians. The Philippians, the church at uh, Thessalonica, where Paul got threatened and had to leave town, he came to Berea. They were more noble than the others. This Berea, Philippi, Philippi, Thessalonica, those are the Macedonians. Those are those churches. They're real people. They're not just historical figures. They're real people. 
with a relationship <laughs> with God. A jailer who had washed Paul's wounds. I mean, he cared for Paul. There was a connection there. What an amazing uh, happening here. He says, I rejoice. Uh, and, and he said, I want you to know about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, and probably others. And so, uh, the care. Paul says, he said, he wants to make these Corinthians excited about giving. They were people with money. They had a good economy. Those Macedonians, that was a different story altogether. They were in a poor, underdeveloped area, and they just, they just didn't have it, so to speak. The Corinthians, they were in the wilderness. There was trade on the, the two harbors in one city, yeah, a little bit apart, and they, they could drag ships from one end to the other. Uh, to avoid the treacherous waters around there, on, around Achaia. But what a blessing for Paul to be in Corinth and to challenge those Corinthians. They had money. They were able. They could. I'm going to give you just an illustration. Uh, at one time I said to a pastor in Romania, I said, faith promise is such a blessing. And it is a wonderful blessing to your people. He said, Okay, John, you preach it. And so, so, and so that's what I did. I challenged the people, and I told them about the grace of God. The churches of Macedonia gave of themselves. They were so poor. They gave themselves first. And nothing happened at the end of the service. Nobody came forward. Nothing happened. And about 10, 15 minutes, it was dark. You know, there's no street lights, no, no shops to go to, no eating places. It was dark, and uh, it was just... Uh, Nothing happened. Either. And after 10 minutes, the first one came back. And there was one chicken that was dressed already before they had gone to church. It was at home. They brought it and brought it to the pastor. Somebody else had a, a big jar with milk. And it already, the cow had already been milked before church. You don't do that. Uh, and, and they brought them the milk to the pastor. And the, there were loaves of bread. They had already been baked before. And they brought them to the church. He loaded up his trunk, the trunk of his car, because he had guests, he had visitors. What an amazing thing. You know, people are never too poor to give if they give from the heart. If you give from the wallet, you're always too poor. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And it didn't work only, it doesn't only work in, in areas where people are poor, but it, it works everywhere. I just give my personal testimony. I, we have a car. It's been sitting on jacks for a couple of years. In fact, we bought a vehicle eight years ago, and out of those eight years, seven and a half years has been on jacks. <laughs> Just make sure I wouldn't have to pay for new tires. You know, I'm trying to think ahead. Yeah. We had a blowout once, and so I learned. So uh, what a blessing it is. And then, and then it not only needed um, a new compressor because of the seals that leaked, uh, I didn't know you had to put the compressor on jacks as well. I didn't, but anyway, I'm just kidding. I didn't know uh, brakes, calipers, uh, at, you know, sometimes they don't release at the right time. And so there was, I was faced with a situation, need a new compressor and new brakes. And this one was 800 and the other one was 700. And then there was something else, and it came to close to 4000 Oh, yes, I need to pay for insurance six months as well, 500 bucks. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I told Joanne, I said, I have no idea where it's going to come from, but it's not there yet. I wonder how he's going to provide. And then I took the car to the shop. They had it examined in Oklahoma City. They said it's safe to drive because you're doing mostly highway. Uh, it's safe to drive. The brakes, is, they're not failing. You can brake, but sometimes they, and then you get that metal on metal smell like my grandfather's blacksmith shop. You know, it's uh, the metal smell. I went in Springfield to another uh, dealer. The church has a relationship with that, uh, with that uh, uh, mechanic, and, and they said, we can't find a problem with the brakes. Apparently, this thing had, by using it, had eased itself up. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the natural explanation. But I didn't have to pay the seven, eight hundred dollars for it. Now I did have to pay for the compressor, 
not today I need it, but uh, next week I will need it probably. And what a blessing it is to make my wife comfortable and the insurance is being paid. Without any insurance, you can't do this. You cannot do that. You, you have to have insurance, financial responsibility. What a wonderful thing to see that God does, does not only provide in the time of the Macedonians, but that God also provides today. Either it postpones bills or, or you know, defers things, but what a blessing it is to see that God is in charge. Everything that I have, I have from my father, we sing it. In Dutch, I think this, because nobody responds. Do you sing that in English now? Okay, good. <laughs> so many illustrations come to my mind. But Paul cared for these people in Macedonia. Paul cared for the f folks in Corinth. And he, he cared for the people in Judea. Because in Judea, there was a problem. There were poor widows in the church, and there was persecution, and man couldn't work, and there, was a, there were a lot of, there were great material needs. Do you remember reading about, the, in the book of Acts, how there were uh, Jewish uh, widows who murmured against, or the, the, the non-Jewish widows who murmured against the Jewish widows, and God in his wisdom appoints seven men with non-Jewish names, Gentile names, as deacons in the church. It's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to appoint the kind of man, silence all the murmuring, all the complaint. But there were some other needs as well in those churches. And Paul got a burden. How did Paul get the burden? He knew it from Barnabas. Barnabas had gone to Antioch. And in Antioch, Paul, Paul, uh, Barnabas goes out to get uh, the, the Apostle Paul from Tarsus because he had uh, been, what kind of, parked someplace. Nobody trusted him because he was looked upon as a double agent and Barnabas goes after him, the son of consolation. Then Paul and Barnabas go out and start their missionary trips and I know there were some problems. Um, it's very rare that two preachers get along or three preachers get along to, uh, without an argument or a disagreement. But anyway, he, here Paul names these, this collection and he says, in, uh, for instance, in Romans chapter 15, verse 26, uh, if you'd like, uh, read it with me. And uh, you, uh, I'll read it in Dutch and you read it in English, okay? No, uh, I'll go with you to 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians uh, first, uh, 15, verse 26, he said, It hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And so uh, this is what we've been looking at. And, and Paul had Titus given a commission uh, so that Titus could go to Corinth. And now we are ready to read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we read verse 16 through 17. If you would do that with me. We read uh, chapter 8, verse 6. And he said, In so much we desire Titus, and there's the connection with Titus, that as he has begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound. See, he's, he's telling these people, they're excellent believers. They are abounding in a bunch of things. Now this also. He says in verse 7, As ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace, and that is the call, the grace of giving, taking up the offering for the saints, that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment. I'm not giving you a commandment. Ye shall. But by the occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of, of your love. So others have done it, and you can do it, and here is an opportunity to, to show that you really love, not the others, but that you really love God and that you do love your fellow neighbor, your fellow man. For he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He gave himself to die. You cannot be any poorer than that. He gave himself to die. He is the supreme giver. And in his death, he gave us life. What an amazing exchange. What an amazing grace that we received. He says that for your sakes, he became poor. That ye through his poverty, his bankruptcy, his physical death, 
that ye might be rich. Wow. Wow. If you're not overwhelmed by this statement or by this exchange of riches and poorness and poorness and riches, if you're not overwhelmed by this, Paul says, he says, I give my advice. I heard your pastor say this morning at the card in his hand, he said, nobody will come to you. Paul doesn't say, I, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. No, no, there's no commandment. But he says, I give my advice. The wonderful part is when Paul gives advice, he speaks, and this is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here is God speaking. He says, I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. To expedite means to help along the way for you who have uh, begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago and so the problem was they had started but they had lapsed and that's poss po uh, possibly the gentlest way to say it and he says now therefore wherefore because Jesus had become poor for your sakes that ye might be rich therefore perform the doing of it as that there was a readiness to will so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. He says, for if there be first a willing mind, so, so there's a heart involved and a mind involved. What a beautiful combination. Because if the heart is in tune, the mind will follow. Are we getting this? What a blessing. The heart dictates, the mind will follow. And then he says, if there's a first be a willing mind, it's accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that a man hath not. Now we have bookkeeper's faith, that it means I, uh, uh, I have the income, I subtract the outgoings, and the balance I have at my disposal. That's bookkeeper's faith. This is not the kind of faith we're talking about here. Because a bookkeeper can calculate. What you cannot calculate, you have to do by faith. Any accountants here? Any administrative people here? Okay. Keep, keep working at it. Keep working at it. But it's by grace. It is by grace. This is a challenge. This is different. This is outside what is being taught at any bookkeeping course. This is way outside. It is a spiritual enterprise. It's a spiritual undertaking. And he says, uh, uh, he said, for if I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. Pastor said it so clearly before the service. Uh, there are rich people. If, they, if it would depend on the rich people, uh, they don't give because they're rich. that's why they're rich. And it's very logical. Who give the most? Ordinary people. Who gave the first? Their heart and then the Macedonians in a depressed economy. You can give as much as you want to. I'll say that again. Nobody got excited. In a depressed economy, you can give as much as you want to. If you're in tune, the Holy Spirit directed, it is wonderful. He said that there be equality, but by an equality in verse 14, not at this uh, uh, but that now at this time your abundance may be a supply of their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. What a beautiful balance there is. There's the supply, there's the, there's the supply from the one, there's the want on the other, and God sees to it that there is an equality. He balances things out. As it is written, Verse 15, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be unto God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. It's the heart matter. See it again? It's the heart matter. And Titus had a heart that was in tune with the needs of these people, that the grace of God would be stowed on them, that they would, that they would be rekindled, and reactivated and reinstated in what they had lapsed into. And so what a blessing it is that Paul uh, here, um, uh, yeah, well, okay. the, the, the offering had not been completed. They had promised, but they had not performed. And so uh, it's not been completed. And so uh, we have no idea of no way of knowing, and Paul doesn't tell us what the reasons were. 
Now, you and I, we're, we're famous for reading in between the lines. Shall we read in between the lines here for just a moment? Use a sanctified imagination without the guidance and the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. I'm just given my observation. All right. It could be, it could be that there had been a disturbance in the church and people said, I'm not given anymore. You know, when, when somebody needs to be disciplined in the church, and that had to be, uh, that, that causes disturbance with some people. Uh, we don't know if that was the case or not. It may have had something to do with the opposition towards the Apostle Paul. Because Paul didn't only make friends, he also, <laughs> he also was very strong on doctrine and on matters regarding the faith that some people were not ready to give in to. They were just as stubborn as Missourians in Corinth. And they were just as stubborn anywhere in the world. People are not ready to surrender to the will of God. Because it means I will sign my own bankruptcy. I no longer determine what I'm doing. And so Paul had some enemies. I'm reading between the lines here. So uh, there is also a possibility that uh, people had uh, focused on all matters in regard to the church itself and not had any eye for the needs around, you know, uh, around, around them or in the world around them. Whatever that is, Paul does not give a full explanation and he does not, and he does not, he does not confront this church. This is, this is the grace of God in the writing of the Apostle Paul. He does not make him more mad than he has to. <laughs> Do I have to reword this or, or am I being understood? He doesn't, he doesn't rub them the wrong way because of this, for the sake of rubbing them the wrong way. He wants to accomplish a goal, and that's what he desires, and that's what he does. So he doesn't go, uh, tries to figure out all the, uh, all the reasons why it did not happen, or people said it didn't happen. But this is a very important chapter for us, because the Apostle Paul is getting ready to get these people re-excited. They were, initially they were excited when Paul taught it. Now Titus is coming, and Titus is teaching the same subject, and he is reminding and, re and expanding, and he is uh, reinforcing what he's doing. And so this chapter is a, an important chapter. And I would, uh, it, is, it is great to give you responsibility. Some people carry responsibility and make something of it. Yeah? Some, sometimes people say, it's our duty to do this. No, it's not our duty. It's, it's our expression of love to do this. If we don't have the love, please don't. If you give out a duty, you do minimum performance. If you go out of love, you go maximum performance. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. That is good. I needed that today. What a wonderful exhortation. No, that's not. It's, it is so beautiful to see that God wants us to be excited, that God wants to be generous, that God wants to be hilarious. I, I was confronted, I told you, about faith promise giving. And there was a preacher that had come. He had just promoted, been promoted to glory, Dr. Jim Vineyard. I don't know if you know the name. He came to Australia. He put his coat on backwards and he made a mockery of all these people that have white collars and all that stuff when they stand in the pulpit. And so he said, uh, he said very simply, amongst the, the other things, he said, if you have not been given, you have not been given enough. If it hurts to give $5, you give $10. If it hurts to give $10, you give $20. And if you give, hurts to give $20, you give $50. I said, he's not going to stop in my heart. And he said, and if you give a hundred and it starts to feel good, he said. It's amazing. But he was talking about a hilarious giver. He was talking to a Dutchman who was a penny pincher. You know, I, he, he unbolted everything that I knew about economy, about economics, about administration, about meeting, uh, uh, making ends meet. I, he, he revolutionized my thinking. Well, what a, what a blessing it is to be challenged in your, in your faith and to grow and to be, extended, uh, to be extended. And, you know, a congregation like this, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, you know, to have the testimony that you have 50, 50 missionaries, you, but your pastor already sees that there is much more possible. I see that there is much more possible. And I'm not comparing Eastside Baptist Church to any other church. I just look at the Corinthian church and the Macedonian church, and that's where we find the principle. If we recognize the principle and put it into practice, glory to God. 
Glory to God. And if you, if you can support a hundred missionaries, praise the Lord. I don't know, but you need to first be surrendered totally yourself. If you're not totally self-surrendered, uh, first of all, you need to be saved. Yeah, if, if you're not saved, that is your greatest need. Your greatest need is not to be part, become part of faith, promise, giving. Your greatest need is to be saved and trust the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Repent of sin, trust Him. That is a great combination. That's not a work. That is the requirement. What an amazing thing is. And so Paul gives these churches here the motivation. And he said, we, we don't only give because there is a need, but we give because we have the proper motive. And that's what I'm trying to get to. If I have the proper motive, nothing will stop me. If I give because there is a need, then I very quickly discover that I have some needs myself. And my needs take priority over the needs of others. Come on, I, am I the only... Uh, to, this morning I was challenged to be honest. And <laughs> I've been trying to do that all the time. Uh, speak the truth in love. I, I do love you folks. And I'm not mean and ugly. I may look that way, but I am, uh, I'm not... I'm not a, I, was, I was born the way I was. Uh, no apology. I wasn't born old, though. But, uh, never mind. Paul appeals to these churches in Macedonia. I said it, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, uh, Thessalonica, Berea, and, and all the churches of northern Archaea. And, and uh, these churches were poor, poor, but they gave with great joy and liberality. That's the definition of their giving, of their mind, of their heart. Of the, that's the definition, liberality and with great joy. If you haven't had joy in giving, you're obviously not given enough. And he's a Dutchman speaking with authority because I am, and uh, I give my testimony. If it's not if it's not fun to give, it's not rejoicing. If you're not if you're not happy in giving, you got to give more. I'm giving my testimony. I'm not telling you what to do. Paul says, "And to speak not by commandment, I give my advice." And so I give my testimony. What a blessing it is! What a blessing it is! And so uh, there is an example. Paul gives the example. Titus comes to the church in Corinth. He said, "Continue with you, what you started. It's not a commandment. I mentioned it to you." And Paul assures them that it was not his desire to place a burden or a yoke upon their shoulders. It's not so. He said, no, no, no. And we're not putting any pressure on you either because grace of God never puts pressure on anyone. Amen. If God gives you the grace to give, give. You have to have the grace to receive first before you can give. What a wonderful statement. And Paul shows us how important it is. He says, we make you known, they want you to know, brethren, the grace of God. And then uh, he continues that the, uh, the needs, uh, the, uh, the, church, the church in Corinth had been liberal uh, as, as the churches in Macedonia at first. The greatest need that we have is not to feed the hungry or to build the houses for people that don't have accommodation. Uh, the greatest need that we are facing in this world is for people to be lost and face eternity without God. And that means a place. I saw a tract here in the book rack here, or in the tract rack, uh, hell. It is, it's a horrible place. We see trucks driving along the Missouri highways, uh, the interstates, you know, heaven or hell. It is your choice. Jesus Christ is the way. Uh, well, what a message. And just, just somebody paint, painted on the truck. I have no idea why people, but that's the greatest need that people have. It's not to have more goods, more things, more it. And, and so we can, in an extended way, you can reach people <clears throat> that cannot be reached any other way. <clears throat> if I not get personal illustration, but if I use Jerry Daniels, you, you know of Jerry Daniels to Kenya, missionary to Kenya. He made a statement. I get his newsletters every now and then. And he apologized to me when we came to Holland. He said, Brother John, he said, we had, without advertising, we had 600 people that came and watched a video when we, when we, the, uh, when we projected a film on the screen. Word of mouth. And 600 people showed up. That's amazing. It was a different world. Different. He said, I hope you're not discouraged working in Holland. 
and I th appreciated his sensitiveness, sensitivity to, to me receiving his newsletter. But, but I read this month, in fact last week, that they are recounting that the churches that have been started by men who have been instrumental in starting them, men that he had been connected with, churches that his son had started and the, the, man, the disciples of their churches, they came to a total of over 7,000 churches. I'm overwhelmed. Those Kenyans didn't have half the money that you and I have at our disposal. And yet they're starting churches, starting churches, starting churches. It's incredible. And I have no idea how, of the mechanics of how it all works. But, but that's the burden, that's the heart, that's the, there's this desire. And it's a challenge for us, for you and me, for us. And so uh, there are young men there that are about to start Bible college. There are young men there that are maybe in need of a vehicle or, or some transportation. Or that maybe they give them a piece of land and say farm it and provide your own income or food. Uh, it is an amazing thing that how it works in one way of the world, in that part of the world. It doesn't work the same way in exactly every other part of the world. But there, there will be uh, local churches and God calls man into the ministry if men are willing to be called. God didn't call me until I was willing to open up. I prayed, send me anywhere. Dishonest prayer. And in my heart I thought, as long as it's not going back to Holland. I confessed my sin and I said to God, I'm willing. Wherever, whatever. It is so amazing. When you read in the Bible, when men are in extreme circumstances, difficulty, Joseph was in the pit and God was with him. That was an encouragement to me. Joseph was in jail in Egypt because of Potiphar's wife and God was with Joseph. What a blessed thing it is to know that God is with us. I am with you. I am with we, we believed it and so that made it so totally different. And so Paul doesn't just give uh, uh, statistics. Paul doesn't give us any of these uh, what's the word? Uh, a resume or, or a summary to impress us. But all he wants to do is see that we abound in this grace. Now, you may have thought and prayed and maybe agreed with your wife on how much. My wife and I do. We compare notes. And then we compare notes and I usually have to adjust to her. Up. <laughs> I wouldn't dare to make her believe less. I wouldn't. And then, and then usually, a week later, I said, oh Lord, I've not trusted you enough. And then I increase. And it's amazing. <laughs> God's never disappointed us I am confident that if your heart is given to the Lord first that he will meet whatever gives he, he meet and your need not, not only to meet your need but that he may receive the glory of it it's not the money but that he may receive the glory of your the disposition of your heart of my heart if he has my heart he has my wallet amen what a blessing it is to challenge you folks launching out on, <clears throat> on, uh, on the missions, uh, missions uh, month. And here, here we are. Paul doesn't give the statistics. He doesn't intimidate the church in Corinth, what all these Macedonians had done. And Paul speaks in terms of churches that were, that were, that were not able to, to perform uh, because of all kind of excuses or so-called reasons. Uh, and, and here, and here we see that Paul desired. It was not Paul was not after the money, but that the grace of God might be bestowed on this church in Macedonia also. What a blessing that would have been, had they responded initially. We would have missed this great uh, chapter in chapter eight and chapter nine. Uh, what a blessing it is here. If we if we look to chapter nine, and we're, and we're going to summarize. If I see. 
uh, in, in uh, uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 2, he says, I know the forwardness, and the forwardness is boldness of zeal of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Now, today you're being provoked. Yeah? I'm a provocative man. I love to be pro provocative. What a blessing it is that the grace of God might be bestowed on you. And then he says, uh, yet I have sent, in verse 3, I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. This is, uh, this is Titus and two other brothers. So there's three of them, and three is good uh, uh, protection when you carry funds. And so he said, <clears throat> that your, your, uh, lest your boasting, um, our boasting of you, should be in vain in this behalf, that I, as I said, ye may be ready, that we are prepared, not only provoked, but also prepared. And then he says, less happily, if they at Macedonia come with me and I find you unprepared, that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Now he comes to verse 5, he says, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to encourage that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. The bounty is not the loot. No, that's the promised gift that they had promised a year before. The promised bounty, the promised gift. And he says, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not out as of covetousness. He excludes it. He gives on the right motive and how his heart is. And this, he says, this I say also. So there's the prov prov to provoke, there's the preparedness, there's the promised gift. And then verse 6, he says, This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And as you see that there is the bountifulness, and that is it, disproportional. <laughs> the tithe is proportional. Yes, amen. But this giving of grace is disproportional. All the, all the administrators said, no, this is disproportional. And they can recognize it. So every man has he purposes in his heart under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, obviously. So let him give, not grudgingly, if it hurts, or of necessity. Uh, it's my duty, for God loves a cheerful giver. There's the purposing. So we have the provoking, the, pre the preparedness, there's the promises. And there's the proportional, and here's the prosper, the prospect. God loves a cheerful giver. If we we have the saying, "Ain't Mama happy? Ain't nobody happy." Can we? Can I paraphrase that? Ain't the Holy Spirit happy? You ain't happy. Did I say that? And you're still here. <laughs> the grace of God bestowed upon the church of Macedonia. Now, the greatest need is that you receive the grace of God to be saved. Keep that card, put it in your pocket, and talk about that later with the pastor. But what the greatest need is, number one, to be saved. Number two, totally dedicated. And then number three, the grace of giving. I'll stay in